Um, I don't know how many of you, well, you probably know I've been hanging around with orangutans for I think it's 24 years going on now. Every year I make a trip to Borneo, have not missed one. Uh, and it's always been ex-captive orangutans who are being helped to return to forest light. So it's rehabilitation in the non-prison sense. Um, three years ago, I had the unusual opportunity to, do, I was given the opportunity to, to open up a wild orangutan research site. And it just came along at a time when I thought, why not? Mm -hmm. Does it happen that often in your life? I guess I should do that. Uh, and since I'm only 25 years old, I knew I had years of time available to do this, so I thought, well, let's go for it. Uh, so this is partly the story of where we are to date on that enterprise. Um, the talk is a version of one that I gave in Indonesia, and it was for the Indonesian Heritage Society, so it was geared to basically professional people, but amateurs. So it's a little bit pop, and they wanted a... Um, they wanted a cute thing to hang it on, so it's basically a private eye view, because that's what you do. You stalk them, you stake them out, you hide in hides, you, you photograph them with, with hidden cameras, you do all of this kind of stuff, basically snooping on their lives, and that's kind of where the story goes as we go along. Um, so this is now orangutans. We're in Kutai National Park, which is a very large, one of the earliest national parks in uh, in Indonesia. This one's in East Borneo, East Indonesian Borneo, East Kalimantan. Um, and I have to tell you a little bit about the background of the situation for orangutans and about orangutans for people here who maybe don't know too much about them. So you get the picture as to why where I am is even a place worth going and why we're saying doing wonderful things. Um, this, by the way, I think is Uchak. He's an uh, adolescent male, uh, one of over 35 that we found in the area that we truck around, which is lots and lots, so we're doing good. Okay, your basic orangutans 101, this is what you get tested on. Mm -hmm. They are one of only five great apes that survive in the world. Five because these are the others of them. Orangutans up on the top. <coughs> on the left you have gorillas. Next to them, regular chimpanzees. Next to them, the so-called human species. <laughs> and next to them, what's called the pygmy chimpanzee or the bonobo. It's very closely related to regular chimpanzees, but somewhat different. We're all classified as grade 8 humans as well. In fact, chimpanzees are closer to humans genetically than they are to gorillas. If you think of recency of common ancestor, which is how we rate our relatedness within the human world, you're closer to your parents than you are your grandparents because you share a recent ancestor more rec er, an ancestor more recently. So in those terms, chimpanzees and bonobos are closer to humans than they are to great apes. So don't anybody here say great apes and humans. Bad. Mm -hmm. okay. um, of course, the non-human great apes are humans' closest living biological relatives, so they're very important for understanding our own origins. The other problem is we all want the same things, and that makes for major competition. Because what they want, we always want, and we have guns. Back to orangutans, what's special about them? They're the only Asian great ape. All the other great apes live in Africa, so they're unique in being Asian. They are the largest tree-living mammal in the world. Adult male orangutans, wild ones, can weigh up to about 120 kilograms, and they're climbing in the trees. Yeah, you have to be very careful. A lot of them have open bones when they look at skeletons from uh, wild orangutans they find there's a lot of evidence from, of broken bones, so they fall, and a lot of it's because of the large weight, and they just come whack into the ground. Okay. They also have extremely long, slow lives. We now know that they can live up to about 55 in the wild. When I first started in primatology, people were resting for great, estimating for great apes a lifespan of about 35 years. We now know it's up to 55, and in zoos they live to over 60, so very much like human lifespan, especially if you consider this is done without health plans and hospitals. <laughs> All right. Very slow reproduction. Orangutan reproduction in Borneo is one offspring, well, primates generally one kid at a time. So you don't end up with litters like cats of lots and lots, one at a time. Orangutans, one every eight years. It's the slowest reproduction of all primates, including humans. In Sumatra, it can be one kid every 12 years. 
So one of their problems, of course, is extremely slow reproduction. What it does mean is kids have an extraordinary resource in their mothers in terms of teaching and raising them to provide a very strong support for developing their own lives. They are also exceptionally uh, intelligent. Uh, they are some of the most intelligent non-human species in the world. And as it turns out, orangutans may be the smartest of the lot, just by a smidge because all the great apes are very similar, the non-human great apes are very similar in their level of intelligence, but orangutans show up as being just that much more cunning, just a slice more cunning than any of the others. Okay, Where they live, only two places in the world that they live in the wild, the islands of Borneo and Sumatra. Sumatra, uh, in tropical rainforest habitat, so they need the trees. And 80% of the area is governed by Indonesia. Sumatra is entirely within Indonesia and probably about 80-90% of Borneo belongs to Indonesia, they call it Kalimantan, it's just a strip along the north, North Borneo is what it used to be called. Malaysia owns most of it with Sabah and Sarawak, and there's a little salt made of Brunei, which is richer than everybody else. Okay, okay. Uh, orangutans and humans, if you want to see how close they are, this is my favorite photograph that suggests just how similar they can mm -hmm. look. Uh, sometimes with people that haven't looked at apes very much, they're not quite sure whether this is a human or an orangutan. It looks to me very much like an elderly, Asian, kindly gentleman. This is, in fact, a sub-adult sub male orangutan, probably from Sumatra because of quite a, quite a beardy structure. Okay. Um, they also are very much like humans in their development, long and slow. They Baby orangutans, I mean, they, they out-cute humans like anybody. They are some of the cutest things you've ever seen. And this is one of the places where you see conflict because this kind of thing happens a lot. Mm -hmm. People buy infant orangutans as pets, kind of like living dolls, and in some cases they've been even known to share their hair off and treat them like human in infants as substitutes for their own kids. As you can imagine, this does a lot of good for the orangutans. Mm -hmm. okay. Later on, this kind of stuff happens. They're so much like us that we get a cute, we get a kick out of seeing them if you like imitate or pretend to be humans. So these are photographs from Malaysian tourist parks where orangutans are trained to play golf, lift weights, and be there for a photo op. And on the bottom is Thailand. There was a big scandal a few years ago of kickboxing, orangutans being used in kickboxing displays in Thailand. There are people in the world that think this is funny. Mm -hmm. It can be, but again, it doesn't do a whole lot for orangutans. They're basically being used as a version of a slave and a, com a, slave and a comedian to entertain humans. And of course, the only way you get them is by stealing them as infants from their mothers, and the only way you get them from their mothers, because moms don't give their kids away, is you kill the mothers. So all of this depends on shooting and pot-shotting orangutans and taking them out of the trees. Okay. Uh, this is some of the stuff that happens. One of the places you get them is from oil pond plantations and coal mines, places that are tearing down the forest for the resources. The orangutans have nothing left to eat because their forests are being taken down. They'll come out, start raiding whatever they can, what call raiding. They start trying to eat anything they can to stay alive. And before you know it, they start getting uh, caught and pot shot at to, to get rid of them. So this was a mother. Uh, you can see she's looking at all, looking all bones. If you can see here, you can see her ribs sticking out. And her kid that just looks like the life is gone from him. They were shot in, um, shot in an oil palm plantation in central Kalimantan. This is one that got caught in forest fires and was burned to death. And these are some of the situations that make for these kinds of problems. You have logging at the top. It's not so big in Indonesia as it would, but tropical hardwoods, this is where you get them from. Don't buy them. Okay. Upper right, oil palm plantation. I took that picture on purpose because it gives you a sense of the scope. It just goes on and on and on with the oil palm. So there are huge areas that are cut down for those purposes. Bottom left is one of the largest open pit coal mines in the world. That's across the river from where I am right now. They go down 800 meters, and they've, they've uh, I don't know how big their concession is, but it's miles and miles and miles of land that they've, they've just dug up to get the coal, and of course that means no, nothing on the top at all, let alone trees and orangutans. And on the right you find, uh, those are, that's a forest fire picture, there are massive forest fires that go through, more fires that go through Borneo practically every year because people burn off the land to clear it. A lot of them get out of control. There are also natural forest fires, and if you're not careful to get out of control, then there are major forest fires that basically wipe out pretty much the whole island. They've made the news here in Canada a few times. Mm -hmm. Okay, And last of the lot, other than the things that are done to the habitat, even in areas that are supposedly protected, 
nobody enforces it very well. This is a photograph of somebody's yard. You know, there's a house and there's a closed line there. The sign says, Sunghai Wine Protection Forest. Do not cut down the trees, do not kill the animals, la 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 la. This house is parked right in the middle of a so-called protection forest. Clearly doesn't care about it at all, and nobody has done anything to get these people out. So people come in and they raid national parks and they raid other protected forests, entirely ignoring any, any effort to maintain them as a, as a place of nature, and officials don't do anything much to stop it. So of course this doesn't help orangutans. What happens is their habitat is just being wiped out, and there's not much effort even to protect the places that are supposed to be good. Totals for orangutans, 55,000 and falling. 55,000 is the total number of orangutans estimated to survive in the wild anywhere. That's all there are. If that sounds like a lot to you, fit them all in the Air Canada Centre. <laughs> one football stadium, one soccer stadium would hold all of the orangutans in the world. And if you think of it, humans are slimy enough that we can't put, enough, uh, put aside enough land for 55 orangutans mm -hmm. to stay alive. We are that ungenerous in our, in our handling of them. As you can tell, uh, I'm not on the human side on this one. Okay. On top of that, I mean, that's 55,000 world population. That's all orangutans. But there's a lot of variation in orangutans you have to take into consideration. First of all, there are now considered to be two species, not one. Bornean orangutans are a different species from Sumatran orangutans. You can see differences, but now we know genetically they're quite different and their evolutionary history is quite different. On top of that, within Borneo, there are three, three subspecies that are now recognized. And um, this gives you an idea of, I mean, they don't look too different, the Bornean and Sumatran here, except for things like this white coloring here. You don't see that in Borneans at all. So there are some color differences and morphological differences. Smaller jaws is one that you see in the, uh, in the Sumatran ones. This is, a, this is also a younger male than this one. He's just an adolescent. But now, look at how different this guy is. There are orangutans in some areas that have a sort of a black coloration rather than the orangey color that you're normally used to thinking about. These are Pongo pygmaeus morio, the Borneo orangutan, the subspecies called morio, and they're the ones that I work with. So again, one of the things about them is they're a different lot of orangutans and recommendations are now that for conservation purposes, they should be treated as separate units because they do, sat, they do show distinct anatomical, morphological, and behavioral characteristics, so they probably evolve differently. And if you mix them up, it might be a bad thing. Okay? Where they are, this is a map from 2007 of an estimate of what's remaining of the rain tan populations, with the dark brown being the populations. The tree subspecies lay out like this. I didn't have a photograph of it because we don't know much about them. This is a northwestern orangutan called Pygmaeus up in Sabah, what's left in there. This is where clearly most orangutans are, the central west orangutans. It's a subspecies called Wormby. And Morio, the black guys, are in the east, which again is where I am. Uh, and where I am is Kutai National Park, so one of the things about them that I think Kutai is interesting is it's representing these East Borneo orangutans, and it's a very, the very southern end of their range. So they're interesting, the Kutai orangutans are very interesting as representing an extreme of the extreme. So they have, have a kind of a key place in representing the range of things that you can see in orangutans because they get you a particular extreme of what they're like. Okay? How many survived is 55,000? I'll show you what happens when you break it down and start thinking about all these subdivisions. Okay? You've got 55,000. You not only have Sumatra and Borneo, but you also have two political units. You have Indonesia and Malaysia, and of course they handle them differently, so the laws in Indonesia don't apply to the ones in Malaysia, so that makes problems for conservation. So of Bornean orangutans, well the Sumatrans are all in Indonesia, so that's all Indonesian responsibility. But then in Borneo, some of them are in Malaysia, for example, uh, over 10,000 of them are. And when you break them down into the different subspecies, the one I want you to look at down here is the East Borneo orangutans that are in Indonesia. There are only 5,200 of them on an estimated count. Now the Sumatran orangutan up here at 6,500 is listed in the IUCN uh, Red Book of Threatened Species as highly endangered. That is the worst categorization you can get. You can't get any more seriously endangered than they are. And you see down here that poor little Morio in East Kalimantan is in worse condition than the Sumatran orangutan. So they seriously need help from a conservation perspective because there are not very many left. Okay. okay. Ergo, 
part of what I do, or at least how I tried to conceive of the project I'm working on now, is it's a theme and a term that people have come up with before, science for conservation. Yeah, you do the science, but a lot of what you're aiming to do is come up with information that could contribute actively to the conservation work in the area you're working in. So providing better information on the species, providing advice on how you'd actually design effective conservation programs, all that kind of stuff is part of what the aim is for the things I want to do. And again, I'm in Milken at Morio in East Borneo in Kutai National Park, so I have to tell you a little bit about what's there uh, so that you can understand. Partly you have to see how bad things are there before you can understand why where I am is a good place. So this is the bad story, and then it's going to get nicer, I hope. Okay. East Borneo, why anybody cares about it in Morio is it's the worst orangutan habitat. <laughs> it's got the least productive uh, food production for them. They're mostly fruit eaters, and it's very poor f uh, fruit production. Uh, so not very much, partly because of the composition of tree species that are there. And it's also very unreliable. They have seasons, and there are bad seasons that are associated with El Nino that bring these incredibly long, harsh droughts, during which there basically isn't much to eat. So there are very long periods where they suffer prolonged famine. Once in a while they get a feast, but it's very short, like Christmas dinner, and then it's all gone for a year. So they have a very difficult life. How on earth they make it isn't quite clear, because they certainly don't have the kind of diet that what I think of as wimpy Sumatran orangutans are so fussy about, which is fruit, 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 and more fruit. So it's difficult to understand how they make it, especially through some of these really bad periods. Okay? The characteristics that they have, it's a recent book that came out that was trying to sort out how characteristics in orangutans vary with area. With Morio, uh, clearly they look to be famine and drought specialized for good reasons. Um, they can survive for very long periods of time on very poor food. Or you sometimes think they're out there eating dirt or something because there's not much else to eat, but it must be poor food. Probably hard foods because they have the largest, most robust jaws of all orangutans. Okay. They also are probably extreme energy economizers. If you're poor people and you don't have much income in, you have to be really penny-pinching on the spending. So one of the views that comes out of the information that they have now is that these orangutans just pinch their pennies every way they can. They scrimp on everything. So they have the smallest brains of all orangutans, supposedly, because brains eat up something like 20 to 30 percent of your nutritional intake every day. Very expensive machine to pay for. Mm -hmm. You can't put it on a diet. So one way out would be to make a smaller brain, which would be cheaper to run. Okay? They socialize less than other orangutans, because typically you socialize with other people and you have to share your food. This is not good. They can't do it, so they don't socialize much. Supposedly, they travel less. They don't go as far as orangutans do elsewhere. And they rest a lot longer, uh, much more of the day, than other orangutans do. Okay? Um, so again, they're an orangutan extreme that look like they've really minimalized orang minimized orangutan to the bare bones because they don't have much room to do anything other than just barely make it through. So it comes across as an eking out, very <coughs> eager existence. But they are unbelievably tough, resilient, and flexible. To make it in this kind of habitat, you have to be something else. And when you see what's happened to the habitat in East Kalimantan, it's even tougher than tough because not only are they dealing with bad forests, they're dealing with areas that have had most of the tourists raised. Forest raised. So they're actually making it in a worse than a worse situation because they're suffering all kinds of terrible changes to their habitat. Some people have tried to say, I have to say this because I used to do intelligence a lot, that because they have smaller brains, they're stupider than other orangutans. Of course, I think that's a pile of crock. Seems to me these guys have to be the most flexible and the most innovative of all of them because they leave, live in these incredibly uh, sophisticated, incredibly difficult circumstances. So, I went out then to try and see what I could find out about them, but again, let's talk a little bit more about uh, Kutai National Park. Okay? It is a really big national park, 200,000 hectares, which is probably about 500,000 acres. Uh, coastal lowland, been protected since the 1930s for its biological importance. Uh, it was estimated in 2004 to support about 600 orangutans, <coughs> which these days is a fairly big population. It's far from huge, but it's substantial and it's viable. It could live ind independently without problems of inbreeding and whatnot. So it's a good population. Uh, but people have thought it was a write-off for a long time. 
because it suffered two massive forest fires, 82, 83, and 97, 98. It hit the news. These were some of the biggest forest fires in the world, ever on record. The whole, the whole country, the whole island of Borneo went up in flames. And I think they estimated that something like over 90% of the forest in Kutai National Park was destroyed. Twice, not just once, but twice. Okay? They're also surrounded by all kinds of commercial concessions and, um, and uh, settlements. There's a lot of poaching that goes on. There are people now trying to settle on They stupidly built a, right, a road right through the national park, and guess what that means? Everybody comes and they park themselves by the side of the road. So there are all kinds of people squatting along the sides of the road, and they don't just stay there. They cut the fir forest down to burn it. So there's a lot of incursion of people trying to basically preempt or take over the national park. Sold out. Local politicians are encouraging people to squat in the national parks, some of them are, because they would like to turn the place over to coal mines because there's a lot of coal and other important resources in there. So even the, th the authorities that are supposed to be protecting the place are in fact selling it out because they'd rather get the cash from the development. Yeah. And some nitwits claimed that the orangutans in the national park were gone. There was a press release, this one, in 2009 bunch of irresponsible members of what is supposedly an orangutan protection agency <laughs> proclaimed that there were only 30 to 60 orangutans left surviving in the national park. This is a great way to get support for looking after orangutans, right? Say they're not there. Not only is it a way to lose support, it's dead wrong. They had nothing to base their information on, so some nitwit then not only wrote a stupid article, but then went and circulated everywhere they could as a press release so it made international news that all the orangutans had disappeared in this park. Okay. Anyway, uh, it might seem to you then that uh, it wouldn't make a very sensible place for me to go because mm -hmm. the place is garbage. However, there is another version of it. I was talking to the head of the National Park when I first got the idea to come here, and he asked me why there weren't more orangutan uh, researchers in the National Park. And I said, well, frankly, everybody thinks it's a write-off. He got very angry and he said, it's not true, there's lots of good stuff and there's lots of orangutans. So I went and looked and there has been, in fact, information that there are lots of good opportunities in there and there are lots of orangutans. On top of that, there's a lot of other good stuff in the area that makes it a very interesting place to work, not just from the perspective of research, but from the perspective of conservation. The orangutans clearly need support, assuming there are enough to protect. Okay. The very earliest orangutan research in Indonesia was done in Kutai National Park. This is the very first place that people ever studied. And I now have a site one click away from the very first site that was used. So we can see four <coughs> years later what things are like. There is, in fact, despite all the concessions and businesses, a very good support network in the area because the businesses actually give money to the National Park and they get in touch with the National Park if they have troubles with orangutans. So they're actually interested in doing a good job. They don't want to do what you really need to do to make the orangutans happy, but they're willing to consider doing something that would try to make life better for the orangutans. I say, and they give money. So this is an unusual situation where there's a lot of good support in the area rather than none. The forests itself, themselves in the park have now had 12 years to recover. The last bad fires were 97, 98, so we're now more than that. We're 12, 13, 14 years later, 13 years later, and things grow very fast in the tropics, so it's not original forest, but it's green. Um, and an estimate that was done in 2010, a <coughs> survey that was done, is now estimating that the park supports not 600 or 80 tans, but 1,000 to 2,000. Certainly not 30 to 60. And this was done by a real good professional team that went out and did a good job. I'm not sure you can count on exact, on, on the estimates being sufficiently precise, but clearly they found evidence of very good or 80 populations rather than low populations. Okay. okay. Um, so, what I did, when uh, I decided to go ahead and try and set something up was first of all go out and look at the place. I'm, I'm a psychologist, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know from choosing research sites, so I thought the best thing to do was go out and see where there actually were orangutans, and that would be a good place as to where to set up my, my shop. So we made several, several surveys, in particular along the north border, this is a big river that's the north border of the park, we did surveys along 30 or 40 kilometers there to see what we could find as a way to try and see where it might, what, what the orangutan population was like and where, where it might be reasonable to set up on a field site. Um, this is my first favorite picture this year. It looks to me like a bouquet of pirates. <laughs> These are national park people that we went, they're very knowledgeable about the area, so we went out on a, on a two-week survey, with one-week survey with these guys to look at the condition of the park and the orangutans in the area. Okay. 
One of the things we found all the way along that river was evidence of poaching. Um, this is on the top is uh, lumber, lumber that was cut illegally in the park. On the left are hunters' traps, probably meant to catch deer, but they catch other things as well. And on the right is a marker actually set by the coal mine, an exploration marker right inside the National Park. So nobody's respecting the park boundary. Um, some areas were pretty good, probably because there are a lot of rapids along the river, so some of it is difficult to cross and some of it is difficult to travel. So that gives you some protective factors in the area. In fact, uh, as to how difficult it is to travel, about three minutes after I took that shot, the boat split like a matchstick in the middle because of the rapids. Yeah, the place is actually a, a place called Bacharuma, the House of Rocks, and it's renowned for killing boats. <laughs> this is a bit of what the forest looks like. Um, it's not majestic, pristine rainforest, but it's green. So something is definitely growing there, and there are areas that didn't get damaged by the, by the big forest fires, so there's a mixture of secondary, like new pioneering forest, as well as some of the old stuff, so you have certainly things coming back. Okay. Spotting orangutans, we actually saw five or six, which is doing well. You don't normally see orangutans in person. What you see is signs of them, and the thing that you typically see when you're looking for orangutans is their nests. Um, I don't know whether any of you are good at spotting orangutan nests. You want to take three seconds if you can see if you can see where they are, and then I'll mark them for you. In the center. There they are. Yeah, it's just a big, it's sort of a blackish blobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are things you can confuse them with, but you can get pretty good at spotting them. And basically, as we were traveling mm -hmm. along the river, we saw an awful lot of nests, much more than I would have expected to see. Yeah. Uh, where we ended up, where the best concentration of nests was, was this little area, I started, it's a, sort of a thumb is what I think of. It's a, not quite an oxbow in a river, which is probably why it's a good space, because the piece of land with water on three sides and streams running into it, so that means it's growing all year round, and that's good for orangutans because they're plant eaters. Okay. This is a close-up of what it is. There's a little river up here called the Bendili River, so we talk about it as Bendili. Blue is the river, and we run an area from about here down to about there from the side of the river inland. Uh, we have a post right here. This is the site of the original, the earliest orangutan research in, in Indonesia back in the 1970s. We're only about a kilometer away, so we're looking at the version now of habitat the way it, the, the habitat that was studied a bunch of years back. Okay, that's the river. Oh, across the road, also why they picked this, other than the fact that there were good orangutan presence here, there's a road, runs 20 to 50 meters across the other side of the river. So it's very easy access for people who want to sneak in. So part of the reason for choosing this site was it had good orangutan presence and it was really vulnerable to incursions. Typically, if researchers are there, it helps keep people out. So just by being there, we can do something to try and improve the situation for them. Oh, yes, and we built, yeah, cut a trail. I think it's a 9 or 10 kilometer trail that we cut along the side of the river and make things easier to walk. So it's good for patrolling and it's good for us as a start trip to see what, start route to find, uh, to see what's going on. This is some of what the habitat looks. You can see it doesn't look too bad. We have trees, some good trees, kind of good variety. Okay. There's bad stuff. This is the other side of the river. These are directly across from us. The road runs right here. So you can see there's been a lot of damage and it's within, within visible distance of the river. The top right, somebody was cutting down the trees and actually opened fires. It's like 30 meters away across the side oh. of the river. Nobody does anything to stop it. And down on the bottom left, you see, even now you see increasing numbers of people squatting and starting to cut down trees and put in their little gardens and whatnot. So clearly need somebody there to keep track of what's going on. Setting up shop, just to show you where we are, we have a team of basically Indonesians other than me. Uh, I have a field manager, a team of five local Indonesian assistants, interesting bunch of assistants. Some of them worked 30 years ago with the very first researcher who studied orangutans in the area and with several researchers who followed. So I have walking history, and mm -hmm. if I want to know what happened 25 or 30 years ago, I just ask them. Um, we work with uh, a member of the staff of the National Park. It's a requirement by law, so you have somebody from the park who's there, helps protect, but also gives us a lot of information to make sure we don't do bad things. This is how we started off. As you can imagine, it's a little slow to start with, so we were in tent camps for a while with uh, camp cooking. One of the troubles was these areas flood, and I think at one point the water came up to within a couple of 
couple of centimeters from the floor. So we've had to move our facilities a few times because of the flooding. We now have a post more, it's bigger than what this is now, so we have a post with a series of rooms for people to stay in, so we're getting much more comfortable. Have TV in the evening and electricity. Uh, and then what you do when you get settled is, of course, you start, you have to start going out and trying to find the orangutans. And basically you find orangutans by walking through the forest and trying to bump into them. <laughs> they're solitary, and they often don't like to be found, and they're very quiet. Mm -hmm. So it is typically not the easiest thing to do. And in fact, what you start to do, to the first do to start, uh, when first find when you get there is you start to find remains of, of orangutans. You see their nests, you see food that they've eaten. So you see there are traces of orangutans, but you don't bump into them directly. You also need to cut trails through the woods because some of this is pretty difficult terrain to walk through. So one of the first jobs was cutting transects so that we can actually navigate through the forest very well. We GPS everything. So we've got actually a latitude and longitude coordinates of everywhere that we go. So I can build maps of the places that we wander through at the same time where orangutans are fine so you can see how things lay out in space. Here we found something that looks like orangutan foods. The reason there's lots of fruit on that tree is because orangutans, in fact, don't eat that. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be gone. But you start finding things like that. Here are some orangutan foods, typically fruits. Uh, and this is, these are gingers. Very interesting about that. Remember I mentioned orangutans are arboreal and they're fruit eaters? Largest tree-living mammal in the world. They're supposed to be up in the trees. They don't supposedly spend much time on the ground, and they don't supposedly eat that much on the ground. We find, oops, sorry, we find that they're eating terrestrial herbs like gingers quite a lot. Practically everywhere we go, we find them torn apart like this, and that's very characteristic of what they do. So it's already an interesting thing that they're eating quite substantially from foods that you wouldn't think they would normally eat from. Check the trees. One of the other things you have to do is learn to identify trees because that defines their world. What they're looking for is food, and food comes down to which trees, which species have them, and when they have them. So a job for the researcher is basically becoming a botanist because you need to be able to read the forest the same way they're mm -hmm. trying to use it. I'm not good at that, but I have a couple of people that are. And then eventually you start running into orangutans. So these are some of the players. This is a female that we called Agnes and her son Adam, who looked to be four to five years old. Um, didn't bother about us very much. In fact, we found them on the ground. So here's a female. Typically males will come to the ground, females not so much. We found them on the ground. They immediately went up in the trees when they saw us, but they were on the ground feeding when we got them. So they're apparently down there as a normal part of what they do. Okay. Another female by the name of Putri with her son Poor. He looked to be about two years old when we found him. Uh, her reaction was quite typical of uh, orangutans, wild orangutans, when you try to follow them, is they hate your guts. So she complains, she has been, we followed her for a year, she still complains. They make a sound called a kiss squeak when they're ticked off. She does not stop all day long. Her son, who's two, of course, kind of copies his mom, so he makes little sounds too, but he's more curious than anything else. So what he does a lot of the time is he tries and throws something at us, like a little twig, and he makes a nasty noise. And then he stares. He doesn't quite wave at you, but he's obviously quite curious about what's down there and spends a lot of time kind of looking at us rather than being, being worried about us. Um, we've got some immature individuals as well. This is a young and adolescent male. kind of looks like a female and eats like a female, but it's a male. His name is Darwin. He's a real good guy. He's around a lot. He looks like he's maybe eight or nine years old. That very handsome fellow is what would be called a subadult male, so a reproductively adult, but like a young adult human, more than likely. He doesn't have the big cheek pads that come with a full adult male. So he's probably 15, 16 years old. It's all estimate because you don't know. Yeah. I thought I had some others. But anyway, those are some of the characters that we have. Okay, the sciencey part. The topic that I picked for this research project is ranging. It's where they go and what they do. Again, this is a private eye sort of thinking that you learn a lot about individuals by where they go, is what their targets are, what they do when they get there, who it is they hang out with, and how they organize their space. So if you just track after them and keep track of everything you do, you get a pretty good idea of what habitat resources they need and they use, what their patterns are of usage, how their communities are put together. So as a look at these individuals, as the Kutai orangutans, after they haven't been studied for a long time, it looked like a good way to start out to get a sense of how they're operating. Um, you do that again by tracking them. You can also look at the clues that they leave behind, like the food remains. Um, 
and what they try to hide. For example, there are times that they try to sneak away from you. Or, as one of the funny things that they do when they get fed up with being followed, they try to lose us if complaining doesn't work. And the way they lose us is they come down to the ground and they run. Before they come down to the ground, they go directly to brambles or bamboo areas that are very difficult for humans to get through. They know exactly where the brambles are because they go directly to a bad spot for humans, hit the ground, and they're done in two seconds. So very clear that they know how to hide themselves and where are the areas that they can use to make sure that humans can't get at them. Okay. How you do it, nest to nest follows. They are hard to find in the forest, so typically once you've found one, you don't let them go. You try to stay with them for about 10 days, and that means that you follow them until they make a nest to sleep at the night. Then you can go home next morning. You have to be out at their nest before they get up and keep following them for the next day. You try for about 10 days in a row. Whether you can get that, and that's another question, but that's what you try for. So that's how you basically get information. You just track them. Um, and you go out, of course, with your notebooks and your binos. This is fake. They're not really observing, but that's what you do is you have talent. You have sheets with codes and columns on them that you fill in with the particular information you're looking for. Um, often need binoculars because it's hard to see what they're doing 30, 40 meters up in the tree. And in fact, sometimes you can videotape as well. Okay. This is sort of what we have now. The trail cutting, that same area that we have. We have now, these marks are all trails. So we have probably, looks like what? five or six, four or five kilometers square of trails every 200 meters that make navigation fairly easily. Some of them we use for keeping track of plant phenologies, the fruiting and the flowering of plants, so you're trying to keep a record of when fruits are available so you can be ready and have a sense about where the orangutans are going to go. Some of them also used for patrols. In fact, these are old hunters' trails, so we use some of the trails that are already there as a way of monitoring whether people are coming in and trying to take stuff out of the park as well as ways for traveling through the area. Okay. Okay. Um, somehow I think I must have pictures out, but here's some more of the gang. This is Uchi and a male that we thought was her son, so we called him Ucha. He turns out to be an adolescent that was trying to flirt with her rather than her son. <laughs> and he was probably an ex-captive that somebody had dumped there because he was not at all afraid of people when he first met them. In fact, what he'd do is he'd come down and he'd put his hand out like he wanted to play with you. This is not the response of a wild orangutan, so he's probably some young guy that got dumped and was lucky enough to find a female or somebody to track along and managed to make a girl, so good for him. Yeah. Okay. This is her real son, who got named Chelsea because they thought Chelsea was a girl, but Chelsea turns out to be a male. Chelsea doesn't like us. <laughs> That's the kind of response you get if he doesn't like you. He's probably five or six years old. And here is the big, one big adult male that's resident in our uh, area. We call him Otoi, it just happens to be what they picked for the name. But here you can see what an adult looks like. You can see he's got these cheek pads on the side of his face, the big flanges that they get as adult males. He probably weighs 100, 120 kilograms. Sub-adults maybe 50 or so. So they almost double in size. Um, other than that's a look at a bunch of individuals, the interesting thing is we have orangutans of all age sex classes. We have infants, we've got uh, older immatures, we've got maturing males, we've now got an adolescent female, we have full grown adults. The adults, you wouldn't be adult until you're 15 or 20 years old. So the adults that we have would have made it through the droughts and the fires at least the last time around. What's interesting then is you have a community of individuals that made it through some of the bad spots and also the fact that they're, they, they appear to be reproducing in relatively normal fashion. So somehow they made it through the real terrible period from 12, 13 years ago, and they're coming out looking like a rose. None of these look like they're having a hard time, right? In fact, they all look really fat to us. Mm -hmm. So if this is a terrible piece of land, it's really kind of hard to understand it because they don't look like they're having mm -hmm. a bad time. Total, we followed 29 of them now, and we've met 35 altogether. Normal rainy hang densities are probably like one to two per square kilometer in this area. We look like we've got two and a half to three. Now, we don't go that far, and we're in the nice area, but we still look like we've got a good set of orangutans. Mm -hmm. A little bit of the findings. Again, I'm interested in ranging, so you're picking up the issues to look at from research <coughs> material. I do intelligence. So um, there's a mix of trying to compare these orangutans with the standard picture that's out there in orangutans elsewhere in Borneo to see what that looks like. Um, one of the things you can do to look at the sort of the comparative piece is look at how far they travel. Remember one of the stories was they don't travel very far because they don't have the energy to do it. 
they travel less a shorter distance on a daily basis than orangutans anywhere else, supposedly. These are the old values that sexually active females, at most maybe 300 meters in a day. In some areas in East Borneo, only 150 meters a day. I mean, you can get that far in a walker if you are going slowly, so it's not very far. In other parts of Borneo, the central west orang uh, Bornean orangutans, they go like seven, eight hundred meters in a day, a female does, depending on whether you have a kid with you or not. And in Sumatra, they go, they appear to go even farther, up to a kilometer a day for a female. So you, it looks like there is a really striking difference between what happens in East Borneo and what happens in other areas, and it makes sense if they're having to economize a lot on their energy expenditures. Well, we don't have complete results yet, but these are some for two of our adult females with kids who should not be traveling far. They're traveling five to six hundred meters a day. I now have an average over more orangutans <coughs> over a longer period of time. It's going up for everybody included. We're up to about 450, 500 meters a day on average. So that doesn't look like the old picture of East Borneo at all. It looks quite different. One of the implications is if they're really not using very large areas, then if you were trying to plan a conservation area for them, you would calculate on a small area per orangutan. Mm -hmm. These guys are clearly using a lot more. It probably has to do with <coughs> how the resources are spread out. They have to travel far to get the foods that they want. But it's interesting because the picture is quite different than the one that's coming out of other parts of East Borneo. Conservation implications, again, you're going to have to plan differently for how you do things because they're not using very small areas, they're using big areas. Range overlap, they're also supposedly not sharing space because they can't afford to. Again, they can't be social because there's nothing much to share, so you have to keep to your own area and guard it. So this is a plot of, at the time I had them, all of the places where we found two females. The black ones are, the green ones here are Uchi, and the black ones are Putri. They both have kids, so they're both traveling with kids. And it's true if you look at the general lay layout, you can see that Puchi is always down here, mostly down here, and Uchi's here, and it doesn't look like there's much overlap. There's some, but not much. However, if you look a little more closely, there are three other areas where we have found putri. And guess what? They're all of them, all of them in areas that we all, where we also find uchi. If you made a circle, if you tried to encompass all of the areas where we find putri, it overlaps about 100% with the areas where we find uchi. And you can't get out here without having been here and here, so she has to have been traveling this whole little peninsula to have got to these areas and probably came across here to get to this area. So what it looks like to us is huge overlap in area use, not very little overlap the way the standard picture says. Another one, it's a kind of a psychological question, is how they travel through the forest. You know, one of the ideas about animals is they come to bumble their way around in sort of random fashion until they bump into some food and then eat it, and they might remember it, but they don't have anything like a plan and they don't have very much spatial knowledge. Well, there's actually quite a big literature now on cognition on intelligence with respect to understanding space and time. One of the things that people have suggested about orangutans is that they have familiar roots and traditional roots, familiar in the sense that an individual will reuse the same root over and over suggests memory, they know where they're going and they retrace the same areas. Traditional in the sense that several individuals share the same route. So it's not just one, but they're apparently either learning from each other or somehow the whole community knows that there is a better way to travel that they use uh, on a community basis. Again, how they get it, you don't know, but there's a suggestion that then there should be a big learning component involved. So I thought we would look to see what we could find. These are, as just an example of what we could find, Four dates for Putri, the 28th of April, the 19th of August, the 21st of June, and the 18th of June. So these aren't like same day. They're quite a difference apart in time. Whoops. Okay. Maybe I didn't mark it. I thought I had marked it by my hand. Okay. The part to focus on is down here. This is 50 meters. So the distance here is something like 20 to 25 at most. And if you see here, on these four times, on these four days, you've got, at some points, she's using basically the identical route that she'd used before. 
some of these things that are off could be a function of the GPS unit that the readings are imprecise. Uh, but I think the message you can take home is on a first glance, it certainly looks like for some individuals, they have a known route that they're reusing over time. When you talk to the guys that follow them, they say, oh yeah, we've been here, she's going to go here, and then she's going to go there, and then she's going to go to the next place, because they recognize as well that there's a repetitive fast pattern. So it certainly speaks to memory and having learned the route. Okay, that's all Putri. Other one that's kind of fun is this one. This is Uchi on the 6th of March and the 25th of March. This is, the, this is 50 meters here. So if that's 50 meters, we're looking at a distance here of, not, of, of maybe 10 at the most, 10, 15 at the most. Three weeks apart, almost three weeks apart, Uchi uses the same roots. So again, she gives evidence of having a root that she knows and she reuses. And then if you look here, this is what I just showed you. That's the Uchi root, the line with the jog. And if you look here, there's Putri at exactly the same place. So not only is Uchi reusing the route, we have at least one other orangutan that's using pretty much the same route to travel on. So there is certainly an indication that you have particular areas that they revisit and that they travel through. There might be some variation in the travel path, but it seems like everybody knows that if you're going from A to B, this is the way you do it. We've now got a year's data, and if I had it all organized properly, I could show you a map that shows you the layout, and it's very clear there are places that they go to and other places they don't. So the nice thing is I think in the long run we'll have quite nice evidence that confirms the impressions that people have, that they're learning their roots and they know where things are. Okay. Foods. Um, we've now got a list of something like 175 foods that they eat from something like 100, 100 species or so, so quite a large range of things, all plants. The one that I really want to make hay out of as things go along is, of course, their being on the ground, because they're not supposed to be. Again, these are gingers that they eat. This was a place where somebody sat down and probably killed 20 or 30 of the stems in a half an hour. I think Otoy the big male did. More often, what you see is along the trail when, you're, when we're walking, is you see they've eaten one or two. So it looks like they're snacking along the route. It means they're traveling on the ground and they're foraging on the ground. This is also a good one to show that they're eating on the ground. This is bark eaten off a tree, and Indonesians aren't very tall. This guy was about as tall as I was, and orangutans are a little shorter than me, even males. They're about a meter in change. So the interesting message from this is this bark has been stripped pretty much exactly to the height of an orangutan. It's an orangutan that did it. Where was the orangutan eating from? Clearly eating from the ground. It's all down from here. It's, there's nothing you could hold on to to let him suspend himself in place. So the orangutan is eating not just the gingers, but other things on the ground. That means they're spending a lot of time on the ground. We don't see it yet because when we follow them, when they're on the ground, we either use them or they run away. But with better habituation, I'm hoping we can get better information on this. One of the reasons it's interesting is because it's a story about how African apes made it when their forests started retreating because of worldwide climate change, cooling and drying the forests we see. How are you going to make it in forests that are getting fragmented? Well, you're going to have to come to the ground. And they opened up a new feeding niche in, in terms of these terrestrial herbs. By eating those, they managed to make it when they might not have otherwise. So it looks to me that you're seeing East Borneo orangutans do something that's quite similar, and that is relying on resources that are in an area where they probably didn't, an area that they probably didn't use before, at least not very much. Yeah. Okay. This one, I kind of get kicked out of this one. We record when we're searching for orangutans, traces of orangutans that we find along the way. This is a map, remember our trail system here, our grid? Yeah. This is a map that shows from our searches, when we go out just looking for orangutans and haven't found them, when we found evidence that they were eating these terrestrial foods. Okay. And these are all the dots. The little dots are places where we found them eating terrestrial foods. The, basically, these are the areas where we search a lot, and the message that I get out of it is everywhere we go, they're eating terrestrial herbs. There are more and less in different areas, but it doesn't matter where you go, pretty much doesn't matter where you go, they're eating some of it. So it seems to be really ubiquitous, and it seems to be very frequent, so it seems to play, at this point, a fairly major role in their feeding strategy, whether they're eating lots of it or just using it for snacks. Yeah. Foraging roots, uh, again, a sort of cognition end. How can you show or can you test whether they really know where things are in their world? Uh, they might have just bumbled into a route that there's only one way, there's only one route you can use, so they use it not because 
they planned it or remembered it, but because it's convenient. So we decided to look and see if there's evidence that they're picking their travel routes. So we picked days when they're foraging a lot. So we know that what they're doing is concentrating on eating. Your GPS every 50 meters or so, every 15 minutes, where you, what, where the orangutan is. And then at the end of the day, you come back, create a parallel route 30 meters away, just by making new GPS points. You go back and you walk each of them, and you record what's on each route. So you can see whether there are resources that are better or worse on the route the orangutan picked versus the route that they didn't pick 30 meters away, basically same habitat more or less. So why didn't they go there? Um, okay. This is a comparison of what we found for Uchi. On her route, resource species 45, the control route, 37. The one she actually used on that day, 25 and 16. So better on her route than the route she didn't take. And for Kutri, same kind of pattern. Systematically better resources on the route the orangutan took than on the route that we created that was presumably possible and she could have known about. It was close enough to be in the same habit, she could have been there. Yeah. What's fun is the experience of people who go out to these routes to evaluate what's on them, because when they come back, having gone through the control route, the response is typically, that was the crappiest thing I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. Not quite, but going on the orangutan route, it's nice, there's good things. You go on the control route and you're coming across all kinds of nonsense, there's not much there, it's difficult terrain. So it seems to be very clear when you go and you try and see what it would be like to go through the forest other than where the orangutan went. They know very well where it's nice to travel and they know very well where good stuff is. So it's quite clear they have good knowledge of the spatial layout of the world, both, the world, both topographically and in terms of the plant resources that are there. Okay. Um, so what does that get me then as a picture of Morio, at least sort of so far? Uh, certainly I think quite different than the picture that's stereotyped now. There's certainly a lot more than 30 to 60 orangutans in the park. The estimate of 30 were already over that in our own tiny little area of four or five square kilometers. So we clearly have a lot more than some people thought were in there. Shortest travel, that's not true. They go quite far, and I think they go often on the ground. Uh, most rest, I don't know. They do rest quite a lot. But what's interesting is even with a lot of rest, they're still going these long distances. So somehow they're not cutting their costs across the board in the way that was suggested. Low range overlap, it looks like high range overlap, so something different than what's been proposed. Worst food, maybe in some ways, but they look like things are pretty good right now, and certainly if you add the terrestrial herbs, then there's a whole realm of foods that they are making use of that aren't much in the repertoire of other orangutans, so it means there's a different range of things that they're making use of, and that may account for why they're doing quite well. On the conservation, and I have to stop for you soon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Just a quick story. Of course, what we get, what we do on the conservation, just being there. By being there, we're detecting places where um, where poachers have come in, and we can sometimes do things to rectify them, like you tear apart uh, traps that they've cut. This was a case where this was a case where there was a little um, pigtailed macaque that had got caught in a trap. It was still alive when our guys went past. He was pretty weak, but he was still alive. They managed to let him go. We don't know if he made it, but at least they got him out of it. Um, this was a case where. People had come into the National Park, cleared a swath about 800 meters along the river, and planted over 300 coffee trees. The notion is they were trying to stake a claim and to come back in five years and say this was their territory. We managed to find it, got the National Park people in, and they pulled them all out. So by being there, we can do a lot of monitoring that they couldn't do on their own. And they've been really good when we report something that's inappropriate. They come in and they, they deal with it quite a lot. So it's been already, we've been a help in terms of cutting down on the incursions. We can also do the sort of documentation stuff, proof of life. Everybody say the place is trashed. So if you can come along with evidence that says it isn't trashed, this is valuable. It's just the information end that says, yes, this place still is worth something biologically. This is the big O, Hoses Langer, that is a very rare species. It's an endangered one, and people thought it had been entirely eradicated in the National Park. Several specialists have been in looking for them, couldn't find them. We got three groups. So without even looking, it turns out that not only are they still there, but they seem to be quite healthy in our area. And we were lucky enough to get some pictures to prove that it's not just a story. Yeah. The other thing as well, other endangered primates, the proboscis monkey, the guy with the big schnoz, uh, a gibbon that's endangered we also have. Um, these are just pretty pictures, but they're just examples of some of the things that you see in the forest. This is a, 
This is um, a ground orchid. I don't know if it's unusual or not, but there are orchids in there that are doing fine. Some <coughs> interesting looking mushrooms. We do very well on strange things. This is a weaselly like character. We've got bunches of snakes, got tarantulas, uh, various kinds of flying squirrels and frogs. Lots of good birds. These are always good ones. These are the hornbills. They're like the toucans of uh, Asia. We have quite a number of hornbills. They also tend to be endangered. Uh, so we're doing quite well with them. And we've got the pretty ones that aren't so endangered. They just make pretty pictures. Yeah. And many, many insects, not as many as there used to be. I have these because one of my research assistants is a fabulous photographer and he really liked to take photographs of the intra he liked to take insect portraits. So we have quite a range of photographs of very strange creatures like this guy. This is a Borneo lantern bug, also quite rare. And they're in the forest that we're in. So one of the things we can offer the National Park is reasonable proof that these things are still there in the park. So they end up with good proof if it comes to trying to protect the forest to say, yes, there's something here that's worth keeping. One management story, and then I'll shut up, just in terms of where we can be of some use in trying to improve conservation programs. This is the coal mine, and over here is a peat dome that they hadn't dug up that they wanted to use as a conservation area. It's 950 hectares, about a square kilometer. They thought maybe they could put orangutans there, like they're protected, it could be orangutan preserve, and if they had to move orangutans, they could put orangutans there. Well, the first thing is, one square kilometer might hold two orangutans. So it's not really big enough for a lot of them, and it's certainly not viable. The other thing is I asked what they were going to do around the peat, the peat dome, and they, oh, well, we're going to mine there, which means pit mines dig down in the ground. So they're going to make a little isolated forest mm -hmm. that doesn't connect to anything with a big hole around it. That's not going to be good for the orangutans. The other thing is peat turns out to be very hydrologically sensitive. It relies on water, water availability at a certain level. If you cut the water, then the peat dies. And of course, if they're going to big, dig big holes all the way around that go 800 meters down, what's going to happen with the peat dome? You're just going to drain it dry. So this thing they think they're going to save, they're basically going to kill by the mining. If you've got some scientists around that can give them some feedback, you could probably alert them, in fact we did alert them to some things they probably hadn't thought of, so it was a nice idea, but biologically speaking it's probably not going to work. If you don't have that kind of input in, you end up with all kinds of strange uh, proposals that are clearly not going to work. They'll spend a lot of money on something that's ineffective and in a lot of cases make things worse than they were uh, before. So that's one of the hopes I have out of what I do, is that partly I can bring information up to date about what's going on with the orangutans in the least part of the park, and that can fuel some of the conservation work, and hopefully we can make it a little better than it was in the past. So my ta take home message, I suppose, certainly it's a damaged area, but it's recovering, it's worth saving, definitely in need, need of help, a very good opportunity to look at an unusual situation that needs attention, and how could you not try anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.